We clearly live in exciting times and uh, uh, quite astonishing events are unfolding uh, in Britain as they are in other countries. Clearly in Britain there's been a fundamental uh, turning point um, which has completely upset the whole status quo in Britain um, which is kind of unusual for a country it has been very stable for a long time. In fact, uh, perhaps uh, some of you have been around a little while and noticed that the events in Britain were very, very slow to develop, very painfully slow. But I think in the last, uh, yeah. what, two, three years, there's been a huge acceleration in the situation. And uh, this uh, election result of this general election is certainly part, I think, of a process. It's not a one-off event. In fact, you can uh, say that uh, it's a part of the, the upset that has occurred in uh, the referendum campaign in Scotland in 2014. It's part of the process where Jeremy Corbyn was unexpectedly um, elected leader of the Labour Party. It's part of the shock we, we, we had with, over Brexit and the result. And now we've had the, uh, basically the collapse of the authority of the Prime Minister and uh, the, the Tory administration as it was. Again, this is not just a, a, a British phenomenon. It's part of a worldwide uh, phenomenon. And it's linked also to the uh, uh, anti-establishment moods that have been developed in Europe and America with the development of Syriza in Greece or Podemos in Spain or Mélenchon and also Bernie Sanders in the United States. It's part of this uh, huge uh, revolt really against uh, capitalism and the establishment as they see it. And this has been a product, I would say, of the crisis of capitalism which emerged in 2008, the deepest crisis that capitalism had faced since the 1930s and the consequences of that crisis which we are feeling even now, where the, the capitalist system was bailed out, where the bankers were bailed out at the expense obviously of the working class, where austerity was introduced and living standards were driven down not only in Britain, but all capitalist countries. And that uh, resulted in a, in a backlash, in a feeling of, of, uh, of opposition, of distrust, of anger, because of the way in which uh, these conditions were imposed on the working class itself. And therefore this is an expression of this anger, this, this deep uh, alienation against the establishment and of capitalism. And uh, what we can see is... Uh, there are abrupt changes in the situation now. It's not a, a gradual, slow build-up of opposition, but uh, wild swings of uh, public opinion. Uh, above all, a polarization taking place within society, a class polarization. After all, we've witnessed a, a huge acceleration in this gulf between rich and poor over the last five or six years. Again, not just in Britain, but everywhere else. Um, and this uh, gulf, together with the further pressure on the working class, obviously gives rise to these, these moods, a, a search for a way out of, of the situation in which people find themselves in. So this is part of this process. And um, uh, of course, it gave rise to quite an abrupt and unexpected for many change in the political situation. After all, that the, uh, <coughs> the, the Tories and... and uh, May, in particular, believed that uh, they would have this snap election. After all, they were 20, 25 points ahead of Labour. They could, could consolidate their position, increase their majority, and also at the same time <coughs> destroy the Labour Party. Because they thought that Corbyn, Corbyn's leadership and the Corbyn Labour Party would not be electorally successful. And with the campaign in the mass media, campaign to, de to, to denigrate Jeremy Corbyn, uh, not only the Tories, the mass media, but also the trouble within the 
the own, his own parliamentary Labour Party, where a whole layer of uh, right-wing MPs were constantly plotting and attacking, trying to drag him down, going to the media saying that Corbyn was completely unelectable. And this was the, the narrative, really, up until the election itself. And, uh, of course, Theresa May and the Conservatives, because they were so far ahead, were clearly overconfident. And therefore, uh, they made certain mistakes. The whole uh, drab uh, campaign that they undertook, which they took for granted they were going to win. Also, the manifesto didn't have anything uh, to, sh to uh, shout about, so we say. Very, uh, very uh, routine kind of manifesto for the Tories. And they, they nevertheless believed on the basis of the, the press and the, Labour, the state of the Labour Party that uh, Theresa May, May would win a majority, perhaps of 50 or 70 or 100, some even say 150 majority. It would be a landslide victory. And that was uh, uh, replicated in all the stories, all the political pundits in The Guardian, in all the, the, the gutter newspapers were re reiterating all this propaganda that the, Corbyn could never win, the Labour Party would be finished, and that the Tories would gain a massive majority. But as you see with the outcome, things turned out to be completely different. Rather than a landslide uh, victory, the Tories lost seats, they went back, and Labour gained seats, apart, uh, uh, contrary to all the expectations that were built up about the party. In fact, the Labour Party did so well, and the camp in Corbyn did so well, that uh, they managed to uh, uh, take a 40% share of the uh, vote, which is the biggest share that they've had for, for decades. You can actually, you can go back actually to, uh, uh, well, the, at least uh, Blair's best years, if you like, but it shows how, how, the, how the ground has shifted, much better than uh, Ed Miliband of Brown and even of Blair in 2005. So this was, this was a, a, an unexpected shock and the ruling class of big business and the to Tory tops were aghast by this particular result. They couldn't believe it because they, they believed their own propaganda. That left-wing ideas in Britain were unpopular, they said. Day in, day out, this was the media angle. And this is the constant propaganda that we're not a left-wing co country, we're very conservative, and therefore a left-wing program could never win the hearts and minds of the people. But clearly, a left-wing program has never been put to the country in such a way, in such a manner, as in, the, as in this particular election itself, with great response from layers. After all, you had the collapse of UKIP, uh, I think they gave just over 1% of, uh, of the of the vote. And the pundits are saying, well, a collapse of UKIP must mean a growth in support for the Conservatives. That, that would seal their big majority, their landslide. But that didn't happen. That the uh, UKIP vote uh, divided, it split. A section, yes, going to the Tories, but also another section going over to the Labour Party. People who had even voted Labour before and moved to UKIP now went back to the Labour Party because it was seen as something to fight for, something different, not the old establishment. Because the reason why UKIP was able to uh, build its support was not simply on, on the issue of Brexit, but it came over as an anti-establishment party. And that's why it was able to have a certain effect in working class areas who were fed up with what was on offer, whether it be Tories or Labour, right-wing Labour, that they had for a long, long period of time, and nothing changed. And that's what they, they and therefore you had a protest. You had a, a big protest. And that shook, uh, again, the, estab the establishment of what, how things were moving in Britain. But uh, the fact that uh, Jeremy Corbyn has managed to uh, turn everything round, basically, uh, in, a, in a big way, and also the, the, the Tories are on the back foot. Uh, rather than uh, be able to form a majority government, they, they found themselves in, in a hung parliament situation. And Theresa May, her reputation was shredded. 
You know, that was the start of the campaign, as you recall, she was seen as invincible and this person who was going to carry us into Brexit and so on and so forth. And they basically based all their, their program and their agitation on Brexit and how we had strong and stable leadership in Theresa May who would guarantee the Brexit deal. And that's all they did day in and day out was to, to repeat this mantra and hope that this would be enough to see them through to, to victory. But of course, uh, another element in the equation was Jeremy Corbyn's left-wing program uh, and manifesto that was put to the electorate pr promising a uh, 10 pound minimum wage uh, of uh, hourly wage of uh, uh, 200,000 and then 500,000 council houses to be built, renationalization of the railways, renationalization of the Royal uh, Mail, of the utilities, of t the abolition of tuition fees, of end to zero hour contracts, and many more, if you like, attractive uh, proposals and policies were now put forward as a package which began to inspire Labour people and above all young people in order to go out and vote and support uh, 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 Corbyn. The other major thing is that Jeremy Corbyn was able to go around the country and speak to hundreds of rallies and to, to, to galvanise, if you like, this support, this enthusiasm. Whereas Theresa May was able to speak to uh, a handful of uh, Tory supporters in a very narrow environment where she took no questions and uh, that was her closeted position. Whereas Corbyn engaged with the people, engaged with young people and built this enthusiasm for an idea of fundamental change, which again is symptomatic of, of, of Bernie Sanders' campaign in the United States and others as well. Another anti-austerity, uh, against, uh, against austerity, uh, against the Tories, against all that we've been, what they call neoliberal economics, an abandonment of that. And therefore he was seen as, as offering something fundamentally different, something fundamentally new to young people and the electorate. And this captured the imagination. And uh, however, you, you couldn't see this in the opinion polls clearly, although there was a narrowing in the gap. From this 20% uh, gap in the opinion polls, it began to narrow to 10, to 5. But even in the run-up to the, the day or two before the election, the whole um, press and media was still full of this story that Labour wasn't going to win and that May was going to have a landslide victory. As we know, that turned out to be uh, com a complete fiction and that May was on the back foot fighting for her political life. And the only way she could save, hopefully save her own skin was to arrange a deal, to, to uh, negotiate a deal with the, with the DUP, the sectarian party in the north of Ireland, a reactionary party. And uh, they hoped on the basis of 10 votes extra, because the, the Tories only won uh, uh, 318 vote, uh, uh, seats. They were, they were short of a majority. An extra 10 seats promised by the uh, DUP would then guarantee the government's survival. But they would be, if you like, in hock to this small reactionary sectarian party. They're even negotiating now. The deal is likely to be struck, if it's not already, already been done. And of course, there'll be a high price to pay. They're not going to do it for nothing. They will be demanding all sorts from uh, May as concessions to them in, for the, in the north of Ireland. This idea of hard Brexit, by the way, has also been thrown out the window because of this vote. Everything's been put on the back, back foot. And she could have uh, very easily uh, have provoked an election. Uh, 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 a challenge to her leadership in the Tory party. It was touch and go. There were many people who were uh, attacking her, many people who were blaming her. After all, it was a presidential form of campaign that the Tories were leading. Therefore, you have to blame the, the, the leader itself. And therefore, she was likely to be booted out. But the only reason, and, and you had people like Boris Johnson throwing their kind of hat in the ring unofficially, Denying, of course, they were going for the leadership, but making it perfectly clear 
Their intentions was if it was available, they would be up for it. And of course, the, um, this uh, would have led to a civil war in the, Labour, in the, in the Tory party, not the Labour, the, the, the Tory party. It opened up a big rift. And uh, above all, there would have been a huge uh, uh, conflict of different individuals fighting over the leadership of the Tory party at the present time. And therefore, it was uh, clearly felt by the men in grey, as they call them, in the, in the grey suits, to say, hang on a minute, let's uh, calm things down. And of course, uh, that's what they managed to do for the te a temporary period of time. She's there, she's a lame duck, if you like, uh, Prime Minister. She's there for a temporary period, cannot last, because the instability arising from a coalition with the D DUP. Um, also the fact that uh, this agreement is, uh, is, is, uh, is as, as, as consequences to it. Because uh, in the north of Ireland, there was a power sharing agreement, a power sharing executive arising from the Good Friday Agreement. And the British government were the neutral uh, uh, party in this power sharing deal between Catholics and Protestants, were in, in effect Sinn Féin and the DUP. But of course now, the, 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 in, in Ireland, because of their election and the anachronism between the DUP and Sinn Féin, that collapsed. The Stormont government has collapsed, it hasn't, it hasn't operated for six months. And it fell to London to try and patch up a deal. Of course, if Theresa May is basically in league with one half of that a power sharing agreement, then they're not going to be a neutral uh, force. And even uh, um, certain bourgeois commentators, even the prime ministers, ex prime ministers like John Major, has warned who was involved in this that this can unravel very, very, ser uh, very, very serious repercussions. The Good Friday Agreement could unravel. You could have the movement towards sectarian violence again in the north and the north, and complete instability as you had in the previous period. That's the danger you've got at the present time involved in these negotiations. But uh, Theresa May is not interested in the consequences. She's only interested in votes to keep her as Prime Minister. And of course, it's uh, even uh, uh, Major said, well, look, that's a bit of a dangerous game to play because it looks very much like um, votes for seats, you know, or rather cash for seats, rather. In other words, you're promising giving money to Northern Ireland through the DUP, cash you've been promised to give, in order that they grant their seats, their votes for the Queen's speech and keeping uh, the May government in, in power. So it's a very dirty deal, if you like, and this has been, will have consequences. Not only people in Britain feeling, what the hell, you're going into a coalition with this reactionary uh, uh, party against abortion, uh, against gay marriages and so on and so forth, extremely illiberal, illiberal government or, or party. And these are the people you're ganging up with. It's like a return to the old nasty party that the Conservatives were known for in the past. So there'll be a lot of unease, particularly amongst young people, of what this, is, this really represents. And that is a, the reason why, even now in the recent few days, there's been a fall in support for the Tories. Not only is it from, from, the, from the support they got in the general election, but this is going down in opinion polls. In fact, Labour is ahead of the Tories at the present time, according to the opinion polls. So Corbyn has been, in, the, in reality, is not the loser, although he did lose. He's the winner. And the winner is the loser. This is the dialectic of the situation. And clearly, Corbyn is riding high now. Because in the past, he's been attacked viciously for the last two years, particularly by his own side, the right wing in the Parliamentary Labour Party. And they've done, you know, done him down, they've attacked him at every particular turn. And in the general election, even the right wing had a, had a policy of fighting their own uh, local uh, uh, election, if you like, ignoring the national campaign and, uh, and just concentrating on local issues and the prominence of their own personality as the Labour candidate in, in a whole number of areas, which you can only classify as sabotage because they refused to not just put Corbyn's name on leaflets. Uh, I'm from one constituency in East London. All we had was just, uh, just a, a list of... Uh, 
you know, individual accomplishment on local issues from the MP, and that was it. No mention of the manifesto, no mention of nationalisation, no mention of abolition of tuition fees. None of that was pushed out in a mass way. That, that had to be relied on by the TV. So therefore, they, they in effect, undermined uh, Jeremy Corbyn's position, undermined the Labour Party's position. And if the Labour Party had been, if like, if these people hadn't been stabbing Corbyn in the back over the previous two years, and, they, and there had be a, been a, un, a real united campaign by the Labour Party in the way it should have been done, then it's quite possible you could have had a Labour government at the present time. Such is the mood, the volatility, and how it could have been altered, given the perception of a Labour a, a Labour Party which is divided and split. You go to any any place before the election, they tell you that. Well, Labour's all right, but uh, is Corbyn up there? He's very weak. The Labour Party's split. It's divided amongst themselves, and that was the perception, which was a correct perception, because the way in which the the right wing were undermining his particular position all the way along. But if that perception had been removed, it would have been a different kettle of fish as far as this uh, election is, is, is concerned. So uh, we have a position now, I understand according to The Guardian, that um, it will only take 1.65% swing from uh, in, in, in a new election to Labour for Labour to become the majority par party in Parliament which will mean it could form a Labour government. One point, in other words, it's a handful of seats, and, a, and really a handful of votes, really, in a number of areas, that could, could uh, not only just throw the Tories out, but bring a Labour government to power. And uh, clearly Corbyn can see this. He's very buoyed up. He's more confident now than ever before. We saw that in, on, uh, uh, was it yesterday, when they went to the Parliamentary Labour Party? And... Uh, he went there and started, instead of the booing and the hissing and the attacks that he had for the last two years, he had a stand innovation. You know, they were clapping him. They thought, this is, this is wonderful. He's, he's saved the day. He's mobilized the young people and so on. Uh, this was a big turnaround. 45 uh, uh, second standing ovation. I think Thatcher, not Thatcher, May got a 25 second standing ovation as far as the Tories were concerned. So that even gives you a bit of an idea of the body language between the two parties. The Tory party now is on the verge of open split and, and uh, civil war, as a matter of fact, in the next period. Because how, how long can she last? I mean, even jo uh, George Os Osborne, who was the uh, uh, Chancellor under uh, the last Tory government, and now the editor of the Eden Standard, of course he's probably got a, a bit of a vendetta against uh, May as well, and he smugly put it that uh, she's a, a dead woman walking and that she's on death row and basically she's unlikely to last before, uh, beyond the summer, which is quite uh, possible. It's quite possible. Of course, uh, you have the Brexit negotiations opening up as well. They've had to delay certain of the negotiations. There's been resignations uh, from the... Uh, uh, the Brexit uh, Commission of the government to run the negotiations have been re resignations this, this week. The whole thing, thing is very chaotic and uh, she's going to, uh, from a very weak position, she's going to engage in negotiations over the future of Britain in Europe with the European Commission. Of course, uh, she was all, uh, you know, thunder and, and lightning before the, uh, the election, but now she'll be as uh, meek, meek as a lamb, I think, because she got, she's got no authority. She's a bit of a walkover in that, in that regard. So I don't think these negotiations are, are rather going to go rather well from her point of view. And of course, any concession that she makes towards a soft Brexit that is a concession uh, about uh, uh, I mean, staying within the, uh, not the single market, but the customs union, um, then that will provoke opposition within the Tory party. The, the Tory party is very, very dominated by hard Brexiteers. They're very, uh, I feel like, um, uh, determined to carry through a break with Europe in the hardest possible way. And if Theresa May is going to uh, soft pedal on that, there's going to be big opposition. A uh, big opposition from the Tories and the Tory ranks. But even when you've got to deal with the DUP, it gives you two, a two vote majority. Two votes. I mean, that's going to be the most unstable government that we've seen for many, many years. 
and it's going to be a government of crisis because they're going to be challenged at each not only just by the Labour and Corbyn but even with their own ranks they'll have divisions so the whole thing's going to be very chaotic probably over the next few months and that could lead to a, a challenge to, the, to uh, her position after all they got a a Tory party conference coming up in September. It could be a challenger to a position, and um, and that could open up a, a, a can of worms then for the for the Tory party because it'll mean an all-out bloodbath about who should get to the, who should become leader of the party. That could provoke a general election. It could bring down the government. Under those circumstances, Corbyn is correct. I think he's got, he's, got, he's in the paper. Uh, uh, I'm ready for election number two. I've got youth on my side. And uh, he is up for it. He's now said he's going to go around 65 constituencies, marginals in Britain, um, and, and put the whole Labour Party on a campaign footing for a new election in the autumn. And, go and, and stay, instead of staying in Parliament, go around every, every, all these marginal constituencies, holding rallies and, 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 and engaging with people to win them over. As he, uh, and, and we saw that in... Uh, on the TV when he was uh, uh, when Parliament was opened, and uh, how confident he was in order to, and, and the jokes he made at uh, Theresa May's expense about uh, you know uh, basically them the, the, the Tories trying to pro prop up a government of chaos, and that he was quite prepared as a, to provide a stable and sound opposition if they were if they were going to vac vacate the the scene. Clearly, he's very confident now. Uh, one of the reasons for that, by the way, he's facing the Tories as the enemy, but behind him, the ranks of the of Labour MPs, which in the past were not very friendly towards him, were now clapping on and applauding him. So therefore, he's got that that uh, that 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 wind in his sails, if you like, in order to take on the, the opposition. So this this has changed things for him. The ruling class is in a hell of a dilemma. They don't know what to do. They they've made a mess of it. What Theresa May said in, in the in, amongst, in the Tory uh, uh, parliamentary faction that uh, she'd made a mess, but she'll get them out of this mess. Well, she did make a mess. She won't get them out of it. It's a permanent mess for them, as far as I can see for them, and therefore this complete dislocation of a crisis situation in Britain. That's all you can say. Of enormous instability, sharp and sudden changes in the situation. This is not normal. It's well, is this the new normality? That's what you've got. An uh, uh, unstable government trying to carry through negotiations in Europe, which are getting more and more difficulty, which could lead to a train crash, actually, as they call it, Brexit. A harder Brexit. There. In other words, they have great, there's great implications here for real um, uh, upset of the whole situation in Britain once again and the emergence of a new general election. And if Corbyn is able to pull it off, which I think under these circumstances, now people got hope in the Labour Party and hope in Corbyn. Before the election, he had to build that up because he was slandered. You know, you had all the newspapers and all the rest of it. You know, he's, a, he's an apologist for, for terrorism and all this stuff. That, I mean, it was continual filth being poured out against Corbyn. It was unprecedented to destroy his uh, credibility and it washed off him because he was able to carry them a message a ra and that's what we're talking about here uh, one of the key lessons that a left-wing program a bold program offering bold reforms is extremely attractive and can win people over enthusiastically to your side including Tories after all look at the seats that, that Labour has won Canterbury it was Tory for a hundred years you got uh, was it uh, Westminster of Kennington or Kensington rather and, and also um, the, uh, I think, uh, I was at Amber Rudd, 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 Rudd uh, in um, Hastings. She also nearly uh, got lost her seat. And shows the, the if you like, the, the fragility of the, of, the, uh, of the Tory electoral support at the present time. Uh, and with a, a bold campaign and a left-wing programme, Corbyn can win a majority. That's the whole point about, that's the, the lesson. The right wing is in the Labour Party, they've always denied that. 
In fact, they're, not, they're very sweet now, and they have a COVID. Oh, yes, uh, we, we've been proved wrong, some of them are saying, and uh, we're amazed by Corbyn's abilities, and uh, how he's changed things around, and he's, he's connected with the youth, and more people have voted than ever before. We have to give credit where credit's due, and all this. And we're prepared to come back now after stabbing him in the back. We're coming back now to the, to the shadow cabinet. We're all, we're all friends now. We're all unity, and so on and so on. Very nice uh, at the present time. Of course, a lot of these right-wingers had increased majorities because of Corbyn. That's the other factor as well. But he's, um, he's, he's accepted, I think, a few will come back in, although the majority will be the same as before. But these uh, right-wingers cannot be trusted. You know, they... Uh, and anyway, I've, see, I've seen him like uh, Hillary Benn on the, on the television, giving compliments to uh, Corbyn and saying, yes, yes, it's all very good. Yes, we did a good campaign. But of course, uh, we need to uh, uh, expand or develop our program now to become uh, more acceptable. In other words, how to win over more Tories and his view is, let's make it more right wing. Let's make it more like the Tory program to win over the Tories. The only way you're going to win over wavering people, and above all, the people who don't vote because they're, they're completely in despair about politics. And I've even seen that. I saw one program on the TV in, uh, I think it was in Tyneside, with this uh, chap. He, he, was on, he was going to uh, food banks. He said, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know where my next meal is coming from half the time. And he said, okay, well, what are you going to vote? He said, I'm not voting. I'm not voting. I've had enough, he said, because every time they have voted for someone, it's all lies. They never carry out their promises. And that's a large element, by the way, of a lot of people's thinking because uh, of the way they've been treated in the past, where politicians have said one thing and got into office and done another. Created enormous disillusionment, not only in labour areas, and that happened in labour areas, Although they paid the cost of that as well, of, of the growth of UKIP at the expense of the SNP in Scotland. The reason why they, they won in Labour areas is because the Labour areas were rotten. They were rotten boroughs. And they, people didn't see the change that was necessary. It was all promises and nothing else. Whereas Corbyn has come forward, not with the milk and water ideas, like uh, Ed Miliband or, or, or Brown or the rest of them, of trying to, trying to appease the system. At least they're talking about taxing the rich, of a radical uh, program for the electorate, which is the most la left-wing program we've had for decades. That's no, there's no doubt about it. And it's very attractive. And it will enthuse people to come out, as it did, to vote. And the second election, on the basis of a crisis in the government, and a, a struggle within the Tory party, and they, they'd be the ones who are split and divided, and that, later, that uh, Corbyn could, could wage a campaign and gain a victory. And I think there's people in the Parliamentary Labour Party who see that as a possibility now. Because you've got those people who are in the middle of, who, who didn't want the Corbyn there. But of course Corbyn now can win. He's, he's a ticket to win. And therefore they prepared to, to, to tolerate uh, these ideas as long as they, they get into government and so on and so forth. In other words, career politicians would go wherever the, the balance is. And most of the Parliamentary Labour Party are made up of these types of careerists who went in politics for their own, their own livelihoods, their own careers, and just became an accident as to which party they would join in order to further their ideas. And many of them have got very right-wing ideas. They'd be well-suited in the Tory party. There's nothing much, very little difference. And in the past, that was the case with Tony Blair. That's why people said, what's the, po what's the difference between the Tories and Labour? There isn't any, different, any real difference. And it, was and it was true. Of course, uh, the Parliamentary Labour Party represents also the, st the establishment, the status quo of big business. Many of them, layers in there. They've been brought up on the Blair years. And these are pro, pro big business pro-market and these are the ones who are of, who voted for cuts in the past of course there's good and they've not really changed they've, they've made compliments they talk the good talk but in reality they've they've not fundamentally changed and that's a danger for the Labour Party because if you could have a Labour government 
You've got to rely on your back benches. You've got to rely on, on the support that they will carry the program through. And if there's any weak links, it will show up because the pressure that will be exerted on that Labour government. And we have to give it, you know, as Marxists, we have to explain the truth to workers. We have to explain the lessons. Marxism has, has been, uh, been told, you can define Marxism as the memory of the working class. In other words, we learn the lessons of the past. We learn the lessons of previous Labour governments. Because if you don't learn it, then you're going to repeat the problems. And every uh, uh, attempt by a Labour government when it's come to power to manage capitalism has always ended in demoralization and prepared the way for the return of the Tories. That's, that's, that's an actual fact. And the reason being, you know, the, you can have good intentions and you can have a very radical program. It's entirely true. Labour in 1945 had a radical program. But the point is, it's about if you're going to base yourself on the, on the existence of the capitalist system, and it, which is in crisis, then how are you going to pay for your program? Well, we can tax the rich, some people say. Well, the problem is the rich are well averse to avoiding tax. They have an army of advisors which can advise them how to hide and uh, remove their liabilities to other countries or whatever to reduce the and at the end of the day a Labour government will not will be faced by an opposition from big business in the city of London they will be out to sabotage a Labour government the ruling class doesn't want a left-wing Labour government because a left-wing government will infuse people will urge them to demand more, particularly in a time of crisis. And of course, that's the other factor in the equation. We had a big slump in 2008. When's the next slump? Well, usually it takes about eight, nine years or whatever. It's difficult to assess. But in today's uh, paper, it was an interesting article and a quote from David Cameron. First of all, he said, shouldn't we as a Tory party move away from austerity, he was asked. And he said, absolutely not. You mustn't move away from austerity. You mustn't risk not balancing the budget in Britain, balancing the books within the next parliament because of the dangerous situation that's going to emerge in, in Britain in the coming period. He said, uh, basically, well, I'll, I'll give you the full quote. Should we give up on trying to balance the budget? after what is now seven years of economic growth. No, he says, I do not think that. I also think that if you have made, if you, ha if you had to make difficult decisions, and we do, even if you put off the date of balancing the budget, it's not suddenly going to be the land of milk and honey. And he goes on to say, if you leave your country with a ratio of debt to GDP, which is too high, the next, polit the next storm that comes along, and there will be a storm, there always is. We haven't abolished boom and bust. We haven't abolished trade cycles. The next storm that comes along will knock you over. So he's basically saying we've got to carry through austerity, reduce the, the debts in Britain, which is still very, very high in comparison to the past, which means more austerity. And then if there, anyway, more austerity means cutting the living standards of the working class in order to prepare for the next capitalist crisis, which is coming in the future. He didn't specify when, but it could come six months, 12 months, 18 months, two years. But we've reached the limits of this recovery, the so-called recovery. There's going to be, and it will be a deeper slump the night than 2008 on a world scale. It's going to be a devastating slump. And under those circumstances, if Labour comes to power, which we will all fight to get Labour to power, we want to get rid of the Tories, we want a Labour government, but we say a Labour government should carry through bold sources policies in order for the reforms that are needed and promised that they can be introduced. You cannot re rely on a capitalist system which is in crisis to deliver reforms. Because every Labour government in the past, 
that's delivered or attempted delivery to deliver reforms ended but ended up because of economic circumstances in carrying out counter reforms and this was not because that they were personally nasty people or they didn't you know they, they you know they relished carrying out these cuts or austerity no it's because of the economic crisis and they have attempted to manage capitalism and if you attempt to manage capitalism then you have to follow the dictates of the laws of capitalism which is profitability fundamentally of propping up capitalism and so on so if the if you have a Corbyn Labour government which we want if it's going to introduce these key reforms which we're in favour of and more we say the only way to sustain that government because it will be met by sabotage, just be clear about it, by the establishment, by the city of, the, of London, by big business. They'll have a strike of capital. They've done it in the past, they'll do it again. I remember, for my sins, the, the Wilson government in 1966, the first time it became, became involved in politics. And that government was very enthusiastically supported by many young people. Within, within two or three years, people were in, were in despair and disillusionment because he went back on all his promises. In, 19, in 1970, when Wilson, who was the Prime Minister, was kicked out of office, he wrote his memoirs. And in the memoirs, he said, in 19, just as I won the election, I had a visit from the, the Governor of the Bank of England. And this Governor said to me, you must abandon your programme. You cannot carry it out. Because it will be in the Indian, it's not in the interest of the economy, and if you attempt to carry it out, there will be a strike of capital. In other words, there will be a sabotage by big business. And Wilson said, Well, if I do that, I'm ringing down the curtains on parliamentary democracy. And uh, the governor said, Well, you know, that's your choice. And that's what he did. Because we in the Labour Party at that time didn't know anything about this, it was all behind the doors. And all we say is, these are the pressures. Look what happened with Corbyn when he was first elected Labour leader. You had the military coming on the television and in newspapers threatening a coup against a, a democratically elected government if Corbyn got to power. If he threatened the defence of the realm, that sort of thing. It shows the sinister class forces that exist under capitalism, that is the ruling class, and, they are, and what they will do and believe me, they were prepared to do anything to protect their privileges and their profits. And if a Corbyn government is in their way, then they will attempt to remove that Corbyn government by sabotage. And of course, they, they can also have pressure on those right-wing MPs who are in the Parliamentary Labour Party, who are like the centrists. And even the economist is talking about a new centre party in the future. And they will attempt perhaps to split the Labour Party, as they did in 1931 with Ramsay MacDonald, again facing a world economic slump, cutting unemployment benefit, in other words, introducing austerity, causing a backlash in his own ranks, resulted in a campaign by the ruling class to split the Labour Party. And they formed a national government under those circumstances. And the Labour Party was thrown into opposition. It moved very far to the left, it is true after that. But all I'm saying is, we have to be realistic on what's going on here. And we have to say we fight, yes, in the Labour Party, to challenge the idea of us resting on the basis of capitalism. The Labour Party was set up for the interest of working people. In 1918, it adopted socialism as an aim. That aim was abolished by Tony Blair. We say it must be reinstituted, because that's the only guarantee a Labour government will be successful in carrying out its policies. On a capitalist basis, there is no solution. On a capitalist basis, there's more austerity. Whatever the government, that's the whole point. That's the lessons in Greece, isn't it? Of Syriza, who's a left-wing government, came to power. They were all, yes, we're going to do it for the working class. And then they capitulated to the pressure. And then they're carrying out the worst austerity compared to the past. Now, those are lessons we need to learn. And in a friendly way, we have to explain these lessons. We must challenge capitalism. We have to overthrow capitalism. There's no middle way here. Cor Corbyn should come in front of the television cameras and say, they're trying to blackmail me. I should say that uh, these, these, these uh, uh, interests of big business are carrying out a strike of capital. 
We must have emergency measures to stop this, to carry out the will of the people. And the emergency measures would be, yes, the abolition of the House of Lords, probably the abolition of the monarchy, which are reserved weapons for big business. And above all, a government to take emergency measures to nationalise the top banks, the insurance companies and the big inst uh, capitalist institutions and bring about workers' control, workers' management and a socialist plan of production. I'm not talking about 500,000 houses. You could produce a million or two million houses if it was nationalised and you nationalised the building industry, the land and so on and so forth. That's the only way. As we, as we used to say, you cannot plan what you do not control. And you do not control what you do not own. It's as simple as that. It's ABC. And the idea you can convince the capitalists to be nice about it and invest a bit here and be, be friendly. Let's be, let's be cozy together. No way. There'll be an attempt to undermine and destroy a Labour government. And therefore we have to warn, if you like, of what needs to be done in order to protect the Labour government, protect the interests of the working class. And that means a Labour government committed to socialist policies which would have a landslide victory in Britain. Don't worry about that. People will be yearning about, yes, control of your factory, control of your workplace, control of your industry. We'll plan everything together. We, are, we can introduce not a 40-hour a, a week in a working week. We can introduce a 30-hour, a 20-hour working week based on the technology that exists, the robotics, the automation, all those things could be enormous inspiration for people rather than the despair of zero-hour contracts, insecurity at work and all the other miseries that capitalism has to offer. That would inspire millions. And therefore, that's, that's on, the, on, on the order. In my opinion, events are going to be shaken up one way or the other. And these ideas of changing society of genuine socialism will be more relevant than ever and will, will attract a large support within the labour movement amongst young people itself. And we have to build that tendency of Marxism within the labour movement in order to provide the backbone, in order to provide the, the stamina and the clarity of ideas and programme so we can have a victory. Not a partial one, not a pyrrhic one, but one that can overthrow capitalism, eliminate the crimes of capitalism. And this will be the beginning. Yeah, you talk about Brexit, appeal to the workers of Europe. Appeal to the crisis-ridden economies of Europe and the workers there. To join us in the fight to overthrow capitalism and establish a, a socialist United States of Europe as a stepping stone to a world federation of socialist states. That can be the future. That's what we have to fight for.